Welcome to First Chapter Friday. This week I'm going to be reading The Story That Cannot Be Told by J. Casper Kramer, published by Athenum Books for Young Readers. I'm going to be reading the prologue and part of the first chapter of this fascinating story. Here is the dedication with a beautiful illustration of an owl that says, To Mr. Howell, my fifth grade teacher, the first one was always for you. Prologue. Once upon a time, something happened. If it had not happened, it would not be told. To the west of the Black Sea was a beautiful country with ancient forests and rivers and a great mountain range that stretched for a thousand miles. This country was called Romania, and it is where my story takes place. There were times when Romania was ruled by princes and kings. There were times when it was ruled by Roman emperors. But not so very long ago, Romania was ruled by the Communist Political Party, which took control after a dishonest election and chose a selfish man as its leader. At first, the people of Romania believed things would be fine. The leader had once been just a shoemaker's apprentice from a rural farming village, a common man like many of them. He said he wanted what was best for his country, and maybe at one time he meant it. But his power grew and grew and grew, and as often happens, it consumed him. The leader held parades in his own honor. He took control of the newspapers and television and radio to make certain they only said things that he liked. He demolished churches and hospitals and forced 40,000 people from their homes in Bucharest, the capital city, so that he could begin building an incredible palace all for himself. It had spiral staircases and marble floors and a bathroom made of gold. Under the leader's rule, Romania and its people fell into poverty and despair. Orphanages were flooded with children. Gasoline, water, and electricity had to be rationed. Families stood in line for hours and hours every day just to buy food, and sometimes there was no food to be bought. Perhaps even worse than all this was the secret police, which used a network of everyday people to spy on neighbors and friends for the government, and which sometimes kidnapped, tortured, or killed those who seemed like a threat. Romanians were never sure who was watching them, so they lived constantly in fear. Everything became dangerous reading the wrong kind of books, listening to the wrong kind of music, watching the wrong kind of films. But the most dangerous thing of all was to write. Because if you wrote the wrong words, if you told the wrong kind of story, sometimes you just disappeared. Some poetry about socialism. When my father arrived home from the university, his face sallow and sagging as if he were sick, he dropped his briefcase on the kitchen floor and braced himself at the sink. He's gone. They've killed him, he said. At the table, my mother set down her copy of Femenia magazine. She glanced at me before she stood, took Tata's hat from his head, pulled him toward their bedroom door and shut it quietly behind them. It was mid-July in 1989 and the electricity in Bucharest was off more often than on. Our tower block concrete apartment building baked us like cabbage rolls in a clay pot, so we always let in the breeze through the balcony doors. I had been sprawled out on the living room floor beside my great tome, the warm air tugging at the pages of my stories. Now I laid my coloring pencil aside and stared, my heart thudding faster with each sound that came through the wall. The apartment was so small you could see it all at once. The balcony where we dried our clothes, the living room and kitchen stuffed together, the tiny bathroom, my parents' bedroom, my bedroom. My mother liked to say, when my fa father wasn't there to stop her, that if we were again forced to move, they would squeeze our whole family into a closet. She missed the apartment we'd had before, with the dining room and the pantry and the corner office that held her piano. I didn't remember it, since we'd had to leave when I was a baby. But I knew my parents had only been able to keep what could be carried. I knew they'd only been given a day. As I sat there, tense and listening, I couldn't stop thinking it would happen again, that whatever had frightened my father would force us to pack up without warning and leave. 
I wondered how much worse things would get if we moved, when the leader had torn down our first home to make room for the wide, gaping boulevard in the palace. He'd stuck us, like everyone else, into horrible grave concrete buildings, stacked one after another, all the same. Sometimes I would imagine my family's life before then, our pantry stocked full of bread and jam, my father's books lining the walls from ceiling to floor. In my memory of a place that I didn't remember, we always had enough food, and the hot water worked on more than just Saturday nights. We could bathe whenever we wanted, even in winter when the central heating went out. But I collected stories, both made up and true, and I was usually good at spotting the difference. My family had never had enough food. We'd never had enough hot water, enough space, enough light. At 10 years old, I could already see how everyone, even me, talked about before in a special kind of voice and with special kinds of words. If we believed that before things were better, we could imagine they'd be better again. This was the way we survived. There was a loud thump behind my parents' bedroom door, something striking their dresser. I jumped when it happened again. Muffled sounds came in great rolling waves. My father's words rising, my mother suppressing the swell. I knew she didn't quiet him because of me, not really. She did it for the neighbor whose ear might be pressed to the wall, for the passerby in the corridor who might pause, fingers feeling in pockets for a pen. It was always best to assume someone was listening. When the door finally opened, I knew I must have looked frightened, so I pretended to be busy writing in my great tome. I was working on The Baker's Boy, a retelling of a parable from school, but my eyes couldn't focus on the words. I kept glancing up at my parents, who had settled into silent preparation for dinner. I tried not to think about who might have been killed, distracting myself by drawing loaves of tan-colored bread around the edge of my title page. But when the sun dipped low, its fading light turned all the great tome's colors to ugly shades of gray, so I tucked the book under my arm and carried it to the couch. With the power still out, the TV screen was just a dark reflection of me holding my stories, but I sat down and stared at it anyway. Thinking about the movies I loved made me feel a bit better, even if I knew there was no chance I'd see them. We used to get two channels that had shows all day long. My mother still talked about when they'd aired the one from America with the man in the cowboy hat, which always ended with somebody shot or in a car that exploded. But now we only had one channel, just two hours a day during the week, and it didn't air shows like that anymore. The programming was usually boring. Speeches given from inside the Grand Palace, televised sessions of the Communist Party, the little men on the screen all cheering together, booing together, raising their fists, broadcasts that reviewed the state guidelines on rational eating or politely reminded viewers of local curfews. On Sundays though, gala animation would come on and we'd get five whole minutes of a cartoon. Everyone I knew had a t that had a television made sure not to miss it. Last summer, over the course of several weeks, I'd caught all of 101 Dalmatians and bragged to the other children when we went back to school that this summer they were showing the Aristocats and the last episode had left the poor kitties scared and alone out in the country. I wouldn't get to see the next five minutes till the weekend, but if the power came back tonight, our handmade antenna might pick up something good from Bulgaria and my whole family might sit down to watch. Then, just like always, we could leave behind whatever horrible thing had happened. Luck seemed to be on my side, at least for the moment, because as we were setting the table, the electricity flickered to life. I asked my father, can I turn on the fan? Sometimes he said no. The taxes were very high if we went over our energy allotment. But tonight he didn't even look at me. He just gave a little gesture with his hand, which I took for a yes, then sat down in his place. The lines around his eyes and behind his big glasses looked deeper than usual, and I began to worry he might really be sick. At the table, the wind blowing through my choppy brown hair, I turned my gaze down and picked at my food. Pie with eggplant and potato, but no meat. The queue had been too long at the butcher's. 
When the line manager had told me and my mother that it would take five hours, maybe six, to get our rations, I thought she'd make us take turns waiting, but instead, we'd simply gone home. I'm gonna stop there. We're not quite through the first chapter, but wow, did we get a nice look into what this story that cannot be told might be about and might tell us. I can't wait to read more. I hope you are excited to read it too. You can soon find this book on Overdrive from the Alameda Free Library. Again, that's the story that cannot be told by J. Casper Kramer and published by Athenum Books for Young Readers.